format, uh, as many of you probably know, because you've been to a few of these, is that we have a 25 to 30 minute presentation, uh, followed by 10 to 15 minutes of questions or discussion. And then we'll turn off the recording and there's time for a catch up for people to just chat at the end if you're interested. Um, feel free to raise your hand at the end to ask questions or put them in the chat. Um, so oops. for today's seminar, um, we have Hannah Grison from the Czech Academy of Sciences, Institute of Geophysics. And she's gonna to talk to us about using magnetic susceptibility as a proxy in archeology. span um, So now I'm just gonna hand over to Hannah and uh, she can take over. So uh, again, hi everybody. And uh, let me introduce myself. So my name is Hannah Grison and I'm working in the Institute of Geophysics of the Czech Academy of Sciences in Prague since 2001. But last uh, six years, I'm working a lot with archeologists and soil scientists on interpretation of proxy data for archeological purposes. So fast and relatively low cost proxy is magnetic susceptibility. So this will be the topic of my presentation. First of all, I should explain what is magnetic susceptibility. So it's uh, uh, magnetic susceptibility indicates how material responds to an applied magnetic field. It's a dimensionless physical property typically represented by uh, the Greek symbol kappa, which is symbol for volume, uh, volume specific magnetic susceptibility. Uh, but uh, because we need to compare materials with different densities, we use mass or in the literature, we can found the term density specific magnetic susceptibility, which is represented uh, by Greek symbol chi. Units are cubic meter per kilogram. So measurements of magnetic susceptibility in soil and sediment of a, a convenient means of assessing the concentration and size of magnetic minerals. Uh, so the nano size fraction can be assessed as relative or absolute change of frequency dependence uh, of the magnetic susceptibility. So for this exists well-established approach. So magnetic susceptibility has to be measured at low and high frequency and then using these formulas. So these parameters can be used for quantification of stable single domain or super paramagnetic SP particles. But identifying SP range solely through frequency dependence is limited. Uh, mostly in case of dominant presence of multi-domain grains of magnetite or hematite. And this I will explain you uh, in detail. So, uh, so it was also main motivation for my study. Uh, so I will introduce uh, Martin Suskiewicz from Poland, uh, uh, study uh, so it's uh, about masking effect published in uh, scientific reports so in this biplot uh, i will use to explain so uh, by uh, on horizontal x uh, uh, show kappa so volume susceptibility and vertical x is frequency dependence in percent Black dots belongs to uh, 15 samples of multi-domain magnetite where volume magnetic susceptibility change from 25 to 500 SI units as show these small, uh, small indexes. So blue, green, and yellow points represent samples as a mixture of SP plus MD grains. 
So SP samples were prepared from three kind of soil concretions from Cambisol. Here are labeled as uh, C uh, S uh, one two three and play play role of uh, pedogenic contribution with high frequency dependence reaching uh, 11 percent uh, but here you can you can clearly see uh, that when these pedogenic samples are mixed with multi-domain uh, fraction frequency dependence rapidly decrease so we can conclude that here we give a proof that superperogenic uh, friction is masked by coarse mounted domain uh, magnetic fraction. But I should point also that Martin used for this experiment volume magnetic susceptibility data uh, obtained by Bardington. And uh, but so it's it's here and uh, so and Bartington, so our sensitivity of Bartington is two order less than sensitivity of Ajiko multifunction kappa bridge. Uh, so I will show you soon how precise measurement play very important role. So let's go to our archaeological side. Uh, so investigated source uh, are from Moravian cars. This locality was used for metallurgical production more than well centuries. Uh, there is a mixture of all possible magnetic contributions. So from human activity, there are remains of furnaces, slag, charcoal, but there are also small fragments of iron ore. Uh, geological background is non-magnetic, so it's a, it's a limestone. So uh, here is a typical soil profile. Uh, in this case, it's from metallurgical site from uh, 9th century. Uh, it's labeled as MKS3. So magnetic data were measured by Ajiko MFK1. Mass magnetic susceptibility, you can see, is very high, and frequency dependence uh, is relatively low. It's reaching only uh, 3%. Uh, but uh, we know that this, uh, uh, this soil is very rich in soil organic matter, about 15%. So we can say that frequency dependence uh, is not able to detect this SP fraction. And uh, moreover, we identified uh, on this sample wide span of magnetic particles from nanoscale to large multi-domain uh, grains. So these same images are good examples. For example, this is a remain uh, of uh, charcoal. So how to solve uh, the identification of SP particles? So we started to test magnetic separation. So we measured again susceptibility and its frequency dependence on magnetic extracts and their residue materials after this magnetic extraction. So we, uh, were, we were really surprised that magnetic susceptibility of residue was approximately one order smaller than original soil, but its frequency dependence increased to some reasonable values uh, for pedogenic uh, particles. Uh, so um, here are summarized these results, and uh, I, I show it in, a, in this chart chart plot so I and uh, I will show you uh, our lab experiment. So we used magnetic properties from profile MFK3 to prepare uh, our experimental laboratory test. Uh, so we started to prepare 20 samples for two groups of magnetic fraction. So 10 magnetic uh, 
so strongly magnetic multi-domain samples were prepared from pure magnetic, ma pure magnetite. Here it's uh, it, these red dots. Uh, and we tried to prepare samples with gradually increasing mass. So susceptibility is about 2050, then minus eight cubic meters per kilogram. And frequency dependence is reaching four or five percent. And then we prepared 10 pedogenic samples, so superparamagnetic samples from Chernozems with constant mass. So it here is in a green color. And frequency dependence of these samples was about 12 uh, 12 percent. And magnetic susceptibility about 250, so 10 times less than, than this magnetite. And later, these two fractions were mixed. So, and this mixture is here in, uh, in this uh, uh, yellow, yellow color. And here I would like to point out that uh, very important is control of uh, brain size. And this can be done uh, thanks to precisely obtained data from Ajipo Kappa Bridge. So we plot relationship between, uh, between absolute change and relative change of magnetic susceptibility. So in case of multi-domain fraction, uh, we show small inhomogeneity but in case of pedogenic uh, samples, uh, homogeneity is relatively good. And for mixture of SP and MD samples, uh, we can see already the masking effect. So with the sample, uh, we did uh, magnetic separation. So, uh, and here are results of this extraction. So yellow, uh, yellow dots correspond to original composite ma composite material before the extraction, and uh, simulate properties of soil profile from Moravian karst. So these yellow, green dots represent residue material with frequency with high frequency dependence and relatively low magnetic susceptibility. Again, it fits very well uh, to some kind of idealized pedogenic contribution. And red dots are magnetic extract with high magnetic susceptibility and relatively low frequency dependence, uh, which should correspond uh, in the profile some remains from slack. Or some some coarse grains. So I know it's not easy to interpret this experiment, uh, but uh, uh, we will we will continue to test, to test different material and different grand size. Uh, and today I will uh, I will. Uh, I will, I, I'd like to show you uh, another result from our experimental study of sandy soils. So for that study, we used uh, investigation on archaeological site of medieval settlement in Prague, Vinod. So it's a haplic chernozem developed on sandstone. And here I show soil profile from that site Again, magnetic susceptibility data and frequency dependence uh, was determined for two fractions, so 0 to, to, to 2 and 0 to 0 0.5 millimeters. And uh, so it's, um, as you can see, that in this A part of horizon, uh, data uh, do not differ. But with uh, in BBC horizon, it start to be uh, uh, there are some variation. So, uh, but in, in sand fraction, 
uh, it should this data should be lower, um, shouldn't be so high because here, for example, we can see that uh, frequency dependence is even higher in, in soil than in in fine salt fraction. So to model this, uh, we prepared a lab experiment. So we we had three types of, of samples. So it's quickly summarized in this this table. So we prepared a, a mixture of pure sand with magnetite, then sand with magnetite and superparamagnetic grains, and sand with only superparamagnetic grains. Again, we determined magnetic susceptibility and frequency dependence. And then we prepared magnetic extraction and measured again magnetic characteristics. And probably uh, the most interesting is that uh, magnetic separation works only for sand with multi-domain particles. So, uh, so we, we reached this original value. So take home message. Uh, frequency dependence alone is not the reliable indicator of superparamagnetic particles and have to be evaluated with respect to brain size. So the present experiments uh, really describe the masking effect and bring new possibilities into studies dealing with strongly magnetic soils due to natural contribution or contamination by coarse particles. So I hope that this works bring some insights to better interpretation of magnetic properties of components, not only for archaeological soil or with archaeological character, but also in environmental studies in general, where multiple pathetic substances are present. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, I think everyone should give kind of a round of applause, uh, virtual round of applause. Um, and maybe with that, we should open up some questions. Um, does anyone have any questions for her? Just raise your hand or put it in the chat. Um, um, so maybe I have a question to start things off. I can start things off. Um, so I was wondering, uh, you, you kind of mentioned that there is, you know, if, if there's a nice description here of this masking effect, um, and it kind of indicates that people who are doing environmental studies looking for different sources of magnetic particles need to be kind of careful about the use of frequency dependence. Is there any better way of discriminating that you would suggest to people? I guess what what would you what would you suggest? Um, so very um, we know that the let's say classical approach is also CBD extraction of pedogenic uh, grains, but. Uh, from my experience, the CBD extraction uh, do not work, uh, for example, in case of volcanic soils. So uh, one must be very careful what kind of grains or pedogenic grains may be uh, present. So that's, that's, that's this discrimination, I mean, from leaching. But also uh, there are um, low temperature measurements uh, using MPMS uh, instrument, but it's uh, for me, uh, I don't have such instrument and uh, it's uh, also quite expensive. So, so I think magnetic separation using just, uh, just uh, distilled water, ultrasonic bath and uh, hand magnet is uh, is the, the 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 most easy way, but as as you saw that 
um, we don't know what really hand magnet will attach and uh, sometimes it's it's a bit tricky. Yeah, thank you. Um, I see a hand raised by Kathy Bat. Hi there, Hannah. Thanks very much. That's, it's really interesting because that's measurements we do in thank our you. archaeomagnetic lab. Um, what do you say when the archaeologists ask, what's the interpretation of this, the archaeological interpretation of the variation in frequency dependence magsus? What's so, the archaeological so, cause mm -hmm. of this? So for for them, it's a uh, proof that uh, their, uh, the human activity was present. And uh, we are like that we are able to evaluate intensity of habitation. So uh, it's uh, not completely a problem of this uh, this sites because uh, there were relatively a lot of archaeological remains from excavations, but sometimes you have a site where uh, archaeologists do not know it was settled or not. But in the soil, these super paramagnetic particles, after after presence of human, after a settlement, let's say um, burning, uh, there is uh, excrements. Uh, bones, decompose bones. So all these contribution increase super paramagnetic uh, pedogenic particles in soil, and they are very stable. So uh, archaeologic uh, archaeologists uh, appreciate that this 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 method to like a fast screening before uh, before uh, uh, time consuming. Uh, excavations. But so, do you think FDMS gives us something more than straight magnetic susceptibility, low frequency magnetic susceptibility? Because you can do uh, magnetic it, susceptibility in situ without mm -hmm. any laboratory measurements. Do you, what, what do you think FDMS adds? Yes, it's, it's also very good because in, uh, it, it can show the, the interesting place where, where, where the uh, where the, the human activity was present in the past. But uh, with the frequency dependence, we can really evaluate it how how intense was this this mm -hmm. this uh, presence of human. Thank you. It's like we have another hand raised by is it Priyashu? Hi. Uh... Uh, nice presentation. I have a small question, uh, and I'm sorry if I missed this. Uh, can we differentiate sp particles, which is from pedogenesis and uh, which is from heating? Like, so heating can produce fine sp particles, super paramagnetic particles, and pedogenesis also do. So, is there any way to differentiate in in both um... using magnetism? I am afraid that it's very, very tricky, and I'm I'm not sure that we are able really perfectly separate this the origin. Probably, if we do some uh, thermomagnetic measurement and see stability of material, uh, maybe it can be solved. But in general, it's it's impossible really. Uh, perfectly discriminate only on the basis of uh, uh, frequency dependence. What we can do uh, and what we are doing uh, it's that we are also um, uh, measuring uh, elemental content of the soil. And we know that, for example, uh, uh, charcoal is rich in, in uh, strontium or in zinc. So when we have uh, frequency dependence uh, correlation with zinc or susceptibility correlation, we can say that was the source. So a susceptibility or frequency dependence alone, it's, uh, it's relatively limited, but with uh, 
elemental components or concentration of elements, it's relatively possible. Uh, it's it's possible to discriminate these sources. Okay, thanks. So because I'm working on some paleo source mm -hmm. and they are really not rich in organic. So I am very doubtful if we have any charcoal in them. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, since they are having pedogenesis and then are heated by lava flows. So, so for, for me, it's very difficult to differentiate. If any mm -hmm. other method on magnetism can help, that is also great. Thank you so much for your answers. Thank you. It looks like we have another question from Edward. Uh, it's not a question indeed. I just, uh, Hannah already answered the question, the previous question, and I would only add on to that, that look at organic carbon. Uh, if organic carbon is present, then it's not, uh, the SP particles are, did not undergo heating. If they undergo well, heating, yeah. organic carbon is, is, is burned. Yes, thank you. But uh, mm -hmm. since these paleo saws are like incipient weathering, like I they know, have I know, but it's it's really you have to play a lot, and, and magnetic properties alone uh, can't give the answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, you have to look at chemistry and and really play around with that. But it's it's uh, it's really very very difficult. Okay, so uh, one more question. Sorry, I'm I'm just uh, intrigued. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it, if we have some uh, correlation, like uh, if simultaneous production of single domain and SP fraction is, is seen, like uh, concentration of single domain particles and uh, SP particles are increasing, sometimes they have been interpreted from pedogenesis. And if there is some imbalance in both the production of SP particle and single domain, people have tried to link with the heating effect. But I'm not very sure on this aspect. It can be anything else. So I think it probably can be answered from um, from uh, measuring measuring uh, uh, AMS or remnants characteristics to discriminate. Uh, I don't know now. It's a, or maybe kind of again some some leaching may be used. So let's 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 look to the literature if it's possible to to dissolve some 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 part of these grains. Okay. Thank you so much. You're yeah, very welcome. Thanks everyone. Um, some good questions. Uh, so if I can share my screen, it might take me a second. Um, so you can see that um, there are uh, sort of our upcoming schedule is that we've got uh, speakers now. We've got a bit of a break and our next speaker will be on the 10th of July and then on the 24th. And there are, <clears throat> excuse me, several slots in August available. Um, so if you're interested or you know someone that's interested in giving a talk, please uh, let us know. Uh, we're always looking for speakers. Um, and then just also a reminder to have a look at the YouTube to catch any anything that you've uh, not watched so far and you missed. All right. Cheers, everyone.